It's the week of August 6, 2018, and this is the Pioneer Growing Point Agronomy Podcast. This is episode 15 of 2018. In today's show, Brian and Josh discuss the potential of the corn crop in soybean insects. And now, your co-host, Pioneer Field Agronomist Brian Buck and Josh Offner. Thanks, Erica. Well, Josh, July has come and gone. We're moving into August. I think it's, what, August 6th today. Uh, things continue to truck along, and uh, what are you thinking overall as we think about where we're at so far this year? Well, I mean, even before Erica gives the GDU update, I just think the big thing is um, we kind of turned the calendar into August, and compared to a year ago, you know, this was kind of probably closer to Labor Day weekend than it was August 1st, so certainly a big change, and, and Erica, I think that's just a good segue to, to take a look at the growing season here, GDU-wise, and, and maybe we'll discuss kind of where the corn crop's at, progression-wise, and uh, kind of think about what are the next steps. Absolutely. Um, so since May 1st in Rochester, Minnesota, we're at 1,834 GDUs and normal is 1,519. This means that we're plus 315 GDUs. Last year at this time, we were minus 47. Since May 10th, we were at 1,740 GDUs, whereas the normal is 1,456, which is 284 GDUs above normal. And last year at this time, we were negative 31. So as normal, and as we mentioned last week, so we're trekking along pretty good. Yeah, we certainly are, and, and certainly, Brian, when we think back to last year, we're minus 47 at this time, and this is right when the heat shut off last year, so kind of moving forward through August, um, I want to say into Labor Day weekend, we pulled into Labor Day weekend triple digits behind the average somewhere, I don't remember where it yeah. was, but I know it was over, maybe flirting with a buck 50, somewhere in there behind, so just a dramatic change, and certainly it looks like temperatures are going to stay at least average, I, I don't see... Um, crazy heat coming, but it looks like mid 80s with a low of 58 to 60 is kind of what we're going to get this week. Yeah, I, depending on where you're at, I'd say the only uh, question mark could be if, if you didn't catch one of the last rains, it was starting to get mm-hmm. a little dry there. We have quite a few different fronts that have come through in different areas. Uh, I'm not sure how much everybody got. I know uh, locally we could maybe use a little bit more rain as we get into grain fill, and especially for soybeans, I think, as we're trying to fill those out. But um, when it comes to GDUs, we're cooking along. Like you said, if you look at where we got last year on Labor Day, we had a long ways to go with September heat. Mm-hmm. Uh, this year we're in a good spot. I mean, corn silage harvest, I wouldn't doubt if that gets started here um, August 25th maybe. I don't know, Josh, yeah. I think you had some earlier stuff that you yeah. were talking about. Yeah, I know I, I did have one grower that planted some really early corn, like 85-day corn that was going to take for silage, you know, just to get some early feed, a place mm-hmm. for manure. And um, sounds like maybe this week that, that could be ready to go. Now, again, that's not the norm. That's, you know, in most cases, you know, 20 plus maturities ahead of everybody else. But that, that, that's the same date I've been targeting. You already referenced August 25th. I was going to say the same thing. Um, barring the heat turning off here, I think corn silage will be hitting its stride in that time frame. So certainly going to be ready for it. It's going to sneak up on us. And um, something we want to be thinking about, and certainly something we'll kind of maybe monitor as we, we get through the month of August. Absolutely. Thanks, to Ryan and Josh. Um, so what's left to do in corn, and what should we expect to be seeing in southeast Minnesota throughout these next few weeks? You know, I, I look at the corn crop at this point, you know, so what's left to do? Um, that's an actionable thing. So not a lot. Unless you got center pivots, you can maybe irrigate, maybe do some things there. But in general, we're pushing, you know, the stage-wise to a point where fungicide applications are going to cease here. And uh, now we just got to probably scout and make sure we're looking for pests to fight in future years uh, and also just kind of monitor and look at look at that, I think, overall. But from an actionable standpoint, outside of running irrigation, there's not a lot left, I don't think. Yeah, and I, I think that's where I'm at. I'm going to do a little sticky trapping today for corn rootworm beetles, and, and certainly, like Brian said, just looking ahead to next year and, and seeing what we need to do to be ready for it. Uh, otherwise, we're kind of in the sit-back-and-wait mode. I know everyone, all of our crop protection friends and everything, it's just kind of finally a breath, you know, kind of a mm-hmm. late start to the season and um, just a lot of weather delays in June. It just seemed like spraying was just never going to end, and, you know, we were slow getting the beans sprayed, and that kind of rolled over into the 4th of July and early July to get that done, so kind of... I think everyone's just kind of just taking a deep breath right now. It's been pretty crazy here for, for two and a half, three months, and, and now we're going to, it's kind of up to Mother Nature the rest of the way for corn, unless you're doing a little bit of scouting, or unless you got center pivots where you can do some, some management there, which with the rainfall, how extremely important to be watching that here down the stretch. But um, it's in a good place. Um, you got a lot of good-looking corn out there, and it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out down the home stretch. So, Josh, if you had to put a number on it, or, you know, at this point, obviously there's a long ways to go. What do you expect out of our southeast Minnesota crop? I, that's a dangerous thing to do. So I should probably do the safe thing and say it'll be somewhere between 100 and 300 bushel. I think yeah. we'll we'll cover it pretty well. <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know, you'll look at it. We have a long ways to go yet, you know, to really fill this out, kernel depth and a lot of other flex things that can happen. 
Um, we're going to need some more rain in a lot of areas yet to really mm-hmm. finish strong. We're going to need sunlight, and we're going to need it not to get really hot. I mean, at this point, um, these moderate temps would be nice to finish it out. So there's a lot of hiccups out there, too, mm-hmm. from spring yet, you know, drown out areas and just some compaction things. So yeah. um, it's going to be, you know, up and down. But I think between 100 and 300 is pretty pretty accurate yeah. number. Yeah, so. and, and a lot of variability. You said it best. I mean, from... From weather to storms to all kinds of things, you know, planning issues, crusting. I mean, all that stuff comes into play, and and certainly I, I do think southeast Minnesota is in a good place as we've traveled around. Um, I think we're in a good place, and uh, overall it'll be be fun to see how it all shakes out here uh, come September. All right, absolutely. Um, so thanks for that update, Josh and Brian. Um, what have you been seeing for bugs while scouting? Well, certainly soybean-wise, you know, still a lot of work to do with soybeans. It's probably... I kind of call it the dog days of scouting, you know, it's just like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of getting wore out from scouting. I really don't want to look for more aphids, and it's just kind of it, more just the hangover effect of the busyness of, of May and June and July, but we got to stay out there. Certainly, um, from a soybean aphid standpoint, we've had some reports of some numbers climbing a little bit. Um, Brian, I know it's not widespread. It's just kind of hit and miss, but it's the most frustrating types is when you find a field that's threshold, it's like, well, we're going to have to keep watching all of them. Yeah, so I was actually just on the phone with a girl right before we started, and he was out scouting, and he said he found 300 aphids per plant. I know um, we found some last week that were at threshold. There's a little bit of variability there. But, you know, then while I was talking to him, uh, he said another field hadn't hit threshold. You know, I was in some last night that weren't at threshold. They're probably like 50 per plant. Um, One thing I did notice last night, there was a lot of small ones. So it does look like numbers are starting to grow a little bit. All you can do is scout and scout each field and not just assume the next one will be at threshold. Mm -hmm. Um, they are there, though, and I think with these temps, there is chance for them to expand in numbers. Yeah, I agree. Uh, another thing, too, Brian, um, you know, around soybean aphids, had a few calls around Japanese beetles last week. Um, certainly something we've seen more of the last maybe couple, two, three years than what we used to see. Um, but certainly defoliation, Brian, is what we're looking for there. If we start seeing up to 20% defoliation, what Japanese beetles do, they'll kind of create skeletons on your leaves. If, if you kind of see, hey, I got a bunch of leaves that are skeleton kind of what's going on there. It's like the Japanese beetle. Not hard to identify. Kind of got a shiny metallic look. I mean, if you see them, um, pretty easy to ID, but something we want to be thinking about too. Uh, and also, Brian, you know, maybe we, we talked about, hey, needing some rains, it's getting dry, and we can't overlook spider mites either. Yeah, so one one tough thing with spider mites is they're the beneficials for them or the things that keep them under at check are soybean aphids. So as we go out and if we knock out all the soybean aphids, use the same insecticide that only works on the aphids, you can actually have a, a mite flare up after you spray for aphids uh, if they're present in the field. So uh, it is important to scout for them, but we were just talking they are tough to scout for. So uh, soybean aphids, pretty straightforward. You go out, you can see them on the plant, you count them. Uh, Japanese beetles, pretty easy to see, pretty easy to see what they do. Um, spider mites, a little tougher, right? I know one trick I've used is I've taken a bunch of plants, so handful of plants, take them out to my white pickup hood, or if you got a white piece of paper and you can shake them out on there and try to see them. But they're small and they're, uh, they are hard to scout for. Yep, they certainly are. But if they are present, um, it does make a play a big role in what insecticide we want to choose. And certainly we spray a lot of pyrethroids you know, for aphids and they'll do good on Japanese beetles. But you know, the organophosphate is what we kind of need for the, the mites. And organophosphate ain't going to do a good job with the Japanese beetles. So knowing of these three pests, you got to kind of scout for all three because it plays a big role in your insecticide decisions. And in some cases, Brian, maybe a tank mix or a premix of those two chemistries um, isn't a bad idea this time of year. We're kind of maybe dealing with three different pests and, and making sure that we don't, you know, spray the wrong one and, like you said, cause a flare-up of the other on the backside. Yeah, and, and generally when I've seen flare-ups, it seems like it starts from the road ditch and will work its way in, but you will mm-hmm. see it as you're, as you're trucking down the road. So, um, Josh, one last thing with Japanese beetles is you do look at them. Uh, if you haven't seen them before, they're a lot bigger than you'll expect mm-hmm. when you get in the field. They almost look like a thumbnail out yeah, there to a certain are. degree. So I have seen a little bit more feeding also, but 20% damage. I think Erica did put something out on, on there to look at yeah. um, what that looks like on a leaf, just so you know. Yeah, it, it, 20% will scare you if you see it. Yeah. But uh, that chart will help you gauge that. And certainly, uh, Brian, I'll retweet that, uh, Erica's tweet as well, and we make sure we get that out there. Uh, Brian, um, you know, with summer coming to a close, before we do the close, Erica, mm-hmm. um, Pro Farmer's coming up in two weeks. Um we're fortunate here in Southeast that finale ends in Rancher, Minnesota. Uh, certainly, uh, Ryan, you're going to be on vacation that week, so we're yeah. going to be kind of missing you there. But um, we're going to do a lot of work that week, a lot of social media. I think we're going to have the podcast probably set up that Thursday mm-hmm. down there and do some reports there. More looking at what's going on locally, you know, how is it compared to last year and other years uh, for Southeast Minnesota. But certainly, 
be looking for a lot of social media and maybe even some special shows that week and uh, stay tuned. Now you'll be gone, but uh, we'll likely get Jay Zilski, Chris Horub, and, and um, we have a new agronomist, Ashley, that just started. We'll maybe get her on the show there too, but uh, certainly look for us there. Erica, always important order to find the show. Absolutely. So the best place to find the show is on Twitter. You can search our Twitter handles at Josh Schaffner, at FarmerBuck1, and at Erica Robertson. You can search on Periscope via the live broadcast and replay. You can search, subscribe via iTunes at podcast.pioneer.com or search on YouTube keywords Buck, Schaffner, and Pioneer. That's a wrap for episode 15, 2018. This show was recorded in Goody, Minnesota. It is produced by Josh Schaffner, Brian Buck, and Eric Robertson. Thanks for listening, and be sure to